and welcome to episode 46 of Gar Boris's Time Machine. Today, Gar, this is going to be a real fun, obvious um, episode because we're going back in somebody else's time machine and um, going all the way back to 1985 and we're going to be talking about the now classic movie starring Michael J. Fox, um, Back to the Future. What can you remember, Gar, um, from the very first time you saw that movie back then? The scene where uh, Michael J. Fox is in, I, I, I guess it was like his bedroom or something like yeah. that, and he had this uh, amplifier, guitar amplifier with a gigantic speaker. <laughs> yeah. And then he hits the strings and, and it just blows him out, you know. You know, you know. <laughs> that scene... For any any person that's a rock and roller, you know, yeah. a musician and that whole thing, that scene alone just totally grabbed me and pulled me in. Yeah, and you know, here's a here's a little trivia. I don't know if you learned um, in doing the research like I did, Gar. Something else I learned um, in doing the research for this that I never knew. Um, there's also another scene where he's kind of like playing a guitar riff. In this kind of yellow, um, yellow kind of suit, and um, when he encounters his his dad George for the first time, like going when he goes back in time, and he's meeting his dad when his dad was in high school, um, to try to encourage him, you know, to um, get the get the Gus Tass, you know, the girl out that he likes. Um, he goes to his room, uh, suited up, playing this guitar riff, which come to find out. Uh, you may have seen there. Was, um, he, he lifts open the, his Walkman and it says Edward Van Halen. Well, come to find out that they originally wanted Van Halen to um, contribute music to the movie, but the but the band wasn't really interested. Oddly enough, but Edward Van Halen um, he contributed that guitar riff, and that's interesting that that has re remained like such a, a a secret until after his death. All you know, recently. Yeah, I, I did not. You know, I, that's a detail that I definitely missed. Yeah, yeah. You know, but uh, you know, he, 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 he's um, he actually uh, Michael J. Fox actually took uh, guitar lessons, guitar lessons yeah. uh, to be able to uh, portray you know him playing the guitar. And I, I have to admit, most of the time that I watch movies yeah. and you you see an actor faking that they're playing yeah. a musical instrument, a musician can tell. Sure. You know, there, there are certain things that if you were actually playing it and you were actually, you would, uh, there are things that a musician will see, they go, uh, no, 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 you know, you see what I mean? Oh, sure, I mean. And, uh, you know, so when Michael Jake Fox did that, I mean, he really, it, it was a, a, a very, uh, a really good decision because it really paid off. Uh, he his his portrayal of him playing guitar, I bought it, and I'm a musician, you know. And when you do that with a musician, that's that's a hats off, you know. What I mean, that's a salute, you know. What I mean, because it's very rare that a musician will watch a actor portraying a musician and will actually see it and really be convinced that they're playing it. Yeah, and if you think about it, Gar, um, in the through the whole history of uh, movie making, I mean that's something that's existed in movies even prior to, you know, MTV and music videos in the '80s. I mean, um, there's so many films that you could probably list off where there's like a musical scene, somebody's playing the guitar, they're, they're pretending they're a musician up on stage, and, and because we're seeing it on the movie screen, um, your, your your mind doesn't go there to all their lip sync, and most people think, oh, he must be singing, he must be playing that guitar, because, oh, you know, I'm, I'm seeing it with my eyes, but then only really after, you know, the, the birth of MTV and we start having music videos in the 80s, do, did people start um, realizing, oh, no, okay, even when they make these music videos and it's actual... Um, performer when they make the video they get up on stage and they're lip syncing their own song they're kind of um doing all this choreograph you know to make the video so that's something more and more people started to kind of learn about once the 1980s hit yeah just one of those natural progressions yeah you know but you know i i just you know i i was very impressed with uh you know with what he did in being an actor not knowing how to play guitar 
taking it that seriously that he would go that distance to taking the lessons so he could portray it in a very believable way. Yeah. He really did a good job in that. And you know, Gar, and, um, huh? in our last episode, we, we talked a little bit about Michael J. Fox quite a bit, you know, because we did an episode on Family Ties. And what's interesting in watching this movie, especially for the very first time back in 1985, is... You know, he's, um, as Alex P. Keaton on Family Ties, he portrays this character who's like, um, you know, an overachiever, business, business-like. He's always wearing a suit and a tie, even to his high school classes, everywhere he goes. Um, a real smart guy. He'll tell everybody how, how smart he is. Where this guy is kind of the exact, you know, Marty McFly is the exact opposite of Alex P. Keaton. And that's why I think um, he just mastered this role. Well, you know, I think you really hit on something that did not cross my mind, but honestly, I think you're 100% right. And and during that time when, you know, this is this 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 whole when this movie came out, it it it, it was a 1985 was a huge explosion of his career uh, because, you know, previous to 1985, you know, barely anybody in America knew who he was. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, you know, we, you know, his, the, the, the family ties was really the only thing, you know, but, but then when he came out with, um, Back to the Future. Now you have Family Ties, and you know, so so y- y- you can really say he mastered both formats. Sure. You know, the, the TV format and the movie format, and that is a very rare thing. You know, I'm not saying it that, that it doesn't yeah. happen, but it doesn't happen very often. It's very rare to see somebody someone be hugely successful in a TV show and also hugely successful in movies. And, and you know, when I was, you know, doing the research for this, I, I also found that he uh, he also came out with the movie Teen Wolf. Oh, yes, in yes. The same year yes, yes. that he came out with uh, Back to the Future. And Teen Wolf, you know, maybe wasn't as hugely successful as Back to the Future, but back in 1985, Teen Wolf was hugely successful movie. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people talking about it, a huge amount of popularity, you know, the, the whole, you know, tongue-in-cheek about it being a teenager yeah. and making it, like, the, all the life, you know, tribulations of being a teenager and being a werewolf. It's just a weird combination that really worked. And, and, and and, and, you know, it's just like now you have the success of the TV show and you have the success of Back to the Future and you have the success of Teen Wolf. You know, at that time, the studio executives, I'm sure, were clamoring. Here, do this project. Here, do this. Here, do this. You know what I mean? I'm sure he was just getting, Michael J. Fox was just getting hit with all kinds of offers. Yeah, and you know, um, you know, Teen Wolf, I mean, even all these years later, um, almost 40 years later, um, that is considered like one of those cult classic movies. You, you see they... they um, air it every Halloween on different cable channels and stuff like that. People will get out their DVD of um, Teen Wolf and watch it every Halloween, you know, at different times of the year. So, and I think, too, just those three um, things you talked about, Family Ties, Back to the Future, and Teen Wolf, those, are, those three are very different types of characters that he played. I mean, I, I think he was very smart. His people working with him were very smart to, you know, they could have said, okay, you know what? Uh, um, we, we want you to do another Marty McFly type of character, but every movie he did was kind of a little different than what he did previously, which I think is why he was able to go on and have such a huge, successful career. Well, you know, when, uh, you know, there are, there are actors and actresses that have uh, incredible amounts of uh, diversity in the type of characters that they can play. And then there are other people that are actors and actresses uh, that are, you know, what are considered one-trick ponies. Sure, sure. Whenever you see them in uh, in this TV show or, or in a movie or even a commercial, it's always that 
persona. It's always that character. And and in in both of them, you know, there there can be people that can have huge amounts of success. Sure. There are a lot of one trick pony uh, actors and actresses that have very very long careers, but. And that, that, you know, that is a big but. The the one-trick ponies, you know, having long careers is kind of a rarity. It's, it's, it doesn't happen as often as the actors and actresses that have diversity in characters that they can portray. So when, you know, when, when uh, you know, the decision maker, makers in the uh, Michael J. Fox camp, you know, made the yeah, decision yeah. to, you know, to diversify, diversify in, in the characters, you know, the, the end result is longevity in your career. Oh, sure. I mean, the only one that comes to mind as far as a one-trick pony that I can say was really able to stay successful was would be Adam West. But, I mean, even look at his career early on, but pre-Batman, he was known for appearing in a lot of um, Westerns. And so at that time in his career, he was thought of as a Western star. But once he did Batman, I mean, um, that kind of took over. I mean, the popularity of the Batman character in the comic book, I mean, um, for the rest of his life, everything he did was Batman-related. Um uh, whether it was uh, voicing like Batman on an animated series or an animated movie or appearing in a comic convention. But what I loved about Adam West, I think the reason he was able to stay um, successful at doing that was because he embraced it. He, he didn't like he wasn't ashamed of it. He he didn't um, try to spit on, you know, um, what he had achieved with Batman. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, he, he was, uh, you know, he was what you would consider, you know, one of those, you know, one trick ponies, yeah, yeah. you know, but, you know, and, and, and having that long career, and you're right, it what it does, did, definitely does have a lot to do with him embracing it rather than rejecting it, yeah, yeah. you know, but, but, you know, um, you know, there, there are, uh, you know, my my favorite actors and actresses are the ones that uh, display diversity sure. in characters. You know, those are my personal uh, favorites. Yeah. You know, but you know, uh, you know, you really can't take away from uh, the ones that you know. Wherever you see them, whatever movie they're in, it's always the say like the Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. You know, he had a long, very long career and very successful career. Same character in every movie. And yet, you know, you Gar, know what I mean? yeah, you, you know, I think uh, Schwarzenegger was successful too because here's the thing with that. Like, um, probably one of his most popular characters, no doubt, is the Terminator. Now, could you imagine if they tried to do a reboot? And could you imagine the guy who, no matter how good they are, the guy that they get to be the next so called Terminator? Could you imagine um, how much he's going to be compared to Schwarzenegger and what he did in the part? Oh, I don't think that whoever that person that would <laughs> yeah, survive yeah. that, yeah. I don't think they would survive. Me neither. Yeah, that's why honestly, we haven't. Honestly, honestly, I think that the fans would just come at them. Be like, who do you? You know, I mean, because you know that's the way fans are. Yeah. And, and Arnold, he did such an incredibly good job yeah. at uh, portraying the Terminator. I mean, I you know I I was so uh, you know you know of course I keep saying it. Yeah. Of course I was around back then yeah. when the Terminator first came out, and when the movie came out, it was actually you know you look at it by today's standards. Sure. The Terminator was kind of low budget. Mm -hmm. The quality of the film uh, filming of it and everything was not that good and everything. So I'm I'm thinking that the studios really didn't have that much. Um, you know, faith in uh, you know the Terminator being successful. I mean, let's let's remember. Only but thing, look yeah. at it now. Yeah. You fast forward to now, and now, oh my gosh, it's hugely successful. And 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 when it came out, it exploded. Oh sure, sure. And now um, you know, you know, and and part of reason for that was um, the only thing he had previously done was Conan the Barbarian, and that wasn't the huge blockbuster that the Terminator would go on to become. But, you know, getting back to today's episode, just talking about time frame where we're talking, um, Back to the Future was released on July 3rd, 1985, 
directed and written by Robert Zemeckis. Now, um, Back to the Future is an American science fiction comedy movie starring then TV star Michael J. Fox, um, who we all knew from Family Ties, and of course um, his co-star was Christopher Lloyd, who most people will remember as Reverend Jim from Taxi, um, as as crazy Doctor Brown. Um, and, you know, wait, wait, I got, I just gotta stop you there. That character that he played in Taxi yeah. was. Uh, to me, the funniest character on Taxi. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just another lost thing over the years. People just do not know. You know Christopher Lloyd... I mean, so many people, that, you know, were famous that came, out, you know, out of that show. And uh, Danny DeVito was considered at that time to star the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. He was such an oddball star. But when, if you really go back and you check out the show, the person that actually gave the most laughs was Jim. Sure. Yeah, and, and you know. The other one that was so poised to be such a huge star and had success before Taxi was Jeff Conaway, who has sadly since um, passed away. Of course, he was before Taxi. He was um, he was in Greece, and um, they thought he was going to go on to uh, you know have a huge career. But of course, uh, sadly, he got um, he got such a heavy drug addiction that just messed up his life, and he sadly died very young from that. Yeah, that was you know I remember. Uh you know, there was one of those uh, reality shows. Dr. Drew. Dr. Drew. Yeah, yes, yeah. and it was right in the very, uh, the earliest times of reality shows. Yeah. It, 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 the very beginnings of it. And, uh, you know, it was really sad to, to, you know, watch, you know, the struggles that he was going through and, and, and the toll that the drug usage, yeah. you know, took on him. Because, sure. you know, back in the years when he he was, you know, doing Grease and he was doing Taxi. He's a very good looking young yeah, man. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but, you know, when you do that, uh, that, that kind of activity, uh, and, and, you know, now you fast forward many years later, uh, you know, and you, you get to see what he used to look like and what he looks like now. And it's not just the age process. It is the actual drugs that took their toll on him. And, and he just, it, it was, oh, it was kind of shocking, you know, to see that toll that the drug usage did on him it was i mean it's it, to me it's things like that yeah. that should really i mean for for people anybody that's thinking about you know uh going down that road you know that cautionary should, tale that should that should be one of those shocking you know to to you know make people change their minds about something like that in fact you know so, and yeah. it doesn't matter yeah. most of his drug problem was prescription drugs yeah yeah so and, and people back in, in those days as long as it was pres as it was prescription drugs oh that made it okay yeah yeah you, you see what i mean and that is just such messed up thinking because those drugs killed him sure those drugs got him addicted those drugs ruined his life those drugs turned him into a monster yeah yeah so much that you know when he did finally leave taxi you know back back around that time you know in the um in the 80s when people would leave sh tv shows like there there wasn't uh, like a huge press release put out about you know why he was leaving he just kind of disappeared and you never really heard from him in, for years until he was on that dr drew show and that was kind of like the last thing he ever did like you said i remember watching that show myself and kind of watching the demise of this guy before our life and then sadly you know there's an episode where dr drew says i oh, know sad we got some sad news da, 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 da. and like wow you know um but yeah you know um it, getting back to back to the future because this has a real kind of um interesting history on how the film kind of really came to be it says um back to the future um was written and directed by Robert Zemeckis, who had previously directed *Romancing the Stone*, uh, which was another uh, huge film in 1984. Then, in 1990, Zemeckis had another hit film with um, *Who Framed Roger Rabbit*. Now, what I was reading is um, the idea for this film. Um, Robert Zemeckis had all the way going back to 
1980, and until it was finally released in 1985, um, they had to make all these changes, starting with um, the, the script itself got rejected 44 times before they even greenlit it. Yeah, and then again, you know, look at the, the, look at the people that rejected it, the yeah, people yeah. behind the desk that have absolutely no creative, you know, bone in their body, you know, making the, the ultimate decisions whether something gets done or not. And, uh, you know, and, and it's just, uh, I, it, you know, this, that's this thing that I just keep bringing yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's a, it's a, it's a really, <laughs> I, I wish I had a nickel for every time I'm bringing this up in the time machine, you know, but oh, uh, sure. it, it just proves the point again. And you know, the only I've been saying all along, you know, the only part of reason they eventually greenlit the film was only after Zemeckis had had a hit film in 1984 um, with Romancing the Stone, which of course featured um, Michael Douglas. Um, but um, so once he had success, that okay, he, he has a successful um, film. This is another thing that often comes up, very much like um, when we did the episode on uh, American Graffiti. Um, George Lucas trying to get everybody to back the film, but but until he got Francis Ford Coppola, who was a was kind of a proven commodity in Hollywood at the time. Okay, you you got him now involved in the film, so so now the studio will back this film. You know, it, 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 you know, we look at it now. Yeah, yeah. As an iconic historic movie in the scheme of all of movies, because you know it, it's it's been determined, you know, by the uh, movie. I don't know these people, powerful people, yeah. that it's it, it has. Could, cultural historical significance, significance. Yeah. Yeah. but you know and then you know that's the way we look at it now and then you look back and and it, and it was kind of a shoestring in the actual fact that the movie got made yeah yeah and and um, it almost didn't it almost didn't it almost didn't get made yeah and, and it, that's just crazy to think nowadays yeah. that there, it, it, it's it's kind of almost a lark that the movie actually did get made and again like you said it, it's another another great example of the people known more than the so-called experts i mean this film was an immediate hit for and for a lot of reasons another thing that um before it was ever um you know um I guess suggested to, to Universal. Um, I guess they tried to get Disney to do the film, and, and they rejected it. Get this, Gar, for the simple fact that they they did not like the idea. You know, um, the scenes of where Michael J. Fox's character Marty goes back in time, and he meets his mother and father in high, you know, in their high school days, and and his his mom, who of course doesn't know it's her future son, kind of gets the hots for her son. They're like, that is not family. Um, yeah, that's not a family uh, movie, and uh, we don't want any part of that. And, and, and it did make for some of the funniest scenes, you know. But again, um, you know, I, I wonder how how um, how often Denny, uh, Disney might be thinking, oh, we should have taken that film. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> that's the that's the funny thing is, yeah. is uh, you know uh, they they considered it dirty. They yeah. considered it incest. Yeah, yeah. And that was that was why uh, you know they were turning it down. But you know the the fact remains is there is a very very large uh, section of our society that likes edgy stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that's the reason why scary movies are so are popular. Yeah. That's the reason why heavy metal and hard yeah. rock is successful you know and i can go on and right on, on about yeah. all of these examples uh, of really popular things that are you know they're edgy things and uh, that was an element of this movie uh is that you know that just um the the disney executives at that time uh you know just did not have a grasp of you know that you know there is a you know there is a um a, an element to edgy that could be the springboard to huge success sure sure 
And that is the edgy element of this, that incest thing. Because I remember when I was watching the movie, mm, yeah, yeah. It, was that, it was that element of, you know, the, the ew, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Ew, mom, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But it, but it, it wasn't a bad, I never felt like, oh, I'm offended by this. You no. know, it was just bringing up that ew thing part of it and it just worked yeah it worked and that's that uh, it, that is everything as, as to why the movie was such a huge success was that edgy part of it that you mom uh, yeah. thing yeah but you, you know gar uh, i mean and, and just talking about it and as we're doing this now um you know it, it makes me realize that you know there, um, you know, when I saw the film almost 40 years ago, um, I was a teenager. So, um, as they say, your, your brain isn't fully developed um, until, you're, until you're about age 25. So, I, I had kind of the same reaction as you. Oh, that, that's, that's, that's disgusting. His mom's in love with him and this and that. But I, I wasn't horribly offended, whereas 40 years later, you know, um, um, I, I don't even have that reaction. It's kind of like, oh, it's just, it's, you know, trying to, it's trying to uh, be funny or whatever. It's, it's, it's different. It's something a little out there, but um, I don't take too much offense to it. And again, maybe it just has its simple fact to do with, you know, our brains are more developed than when we first saw the film. You know. <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 it was funny. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And and you know, uh, you know, there's just some, you know, there will always be. Some people that, you know, are lighthearted people right. and, you know, they're open to, you know, you know yeah. things being, you know, being funny. And there will always be people also in the society that just will refuse to see or acknowledge any funny aspect of it at all because it just does not coincide with their personal beliefs. But, but, and they yeah. are so rigid on yeah. it that there is no compromise whatsoever. And you're never going to change that. The, the, those elements of our society will always... That's a thing that I don't think will, uh, will change. No matter how sure. time goes along, there will always be that element of society and there will always be a much more open Lighthearted element of society too. But but then again, Gar, let's be honest. This is a film where the main plot of the story is about this kid going back in time with this crazy mad professor, but, and they get stuck in time. He meets his parents during their high school days, you know, and and their time machine is a DeLorean. Um, and, and so we're we're we're, um, we're open to those suggestions that um, you can go back in time. Even though we know that's something that's really not possible, we allow our minds to go there because it's a fun place to go, <laughs> to just imagine. Well, just the whole idea, you know, yeah. it, it, you know, at the time when the movie came out, the, the whole premise of the story going you know, back to yeah. the future. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's there are some people. Uh, th I was the the girlfriend that I was with at the time just could not get her mind wrapped around the meaning of back to the future. She just couldn't get it. And no matter how much I tried to explain to her, you know, that, you know, th th you know, this is, th you know, this is what it's about. This is the premise. I could not explain it to her. Wow. She just, just could not get her mind wrapped around this whole idea of, you know, uh, living, you know, in this time and going back to 1955 yeah. and then now you're trying to get back to, to you. your original time, which now would be considered jumping back to the future. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, she, she just couldn't get it. And she is a representative of other people in society at the same time that just could not get their mind wrapped around it. But, you know, that that just brings to, uh, you know, to me, such a really good uh, respect for Bob Gale, because, you know, he was the guy uh, that, you know, came up with the idea of this, 
and the idea he was at his parents' house and he was looking through a photo album of his his parents you know you know when their lives before he was even born yeah yeah and he was thinking to himself oh i wonder if i would have been friends with my dad if i was around back then and then all of a sudden, that was the spark for the idea of, you know, what it would be like, you know, for him living now sure. to go back to that time, you know, and, and to visit his parents. And that's why 40 years later, this film still stands out. Let's just think of the brilliance of that phrase, um, back to the future. That's what makes it stand out from every other movie that we've ever seen on um you know, alleged time travel. It's always about going back in time. It, well, while they do that in this film, it, it's between going back to 1955 and getting back to 1985 where you were... So getting back to the future, uh, that is something that was never even thought of or heard heard uh, about until this picture. And that's why it stands out on its own from all those other time travel movies. It's very original. Yeah. You know, and, and those... those it, that... I think that alone, that aspect of the movie has a huge part of why the movie was so successful. Yeah, and, and you know, and you know, Gar, um, a lot of um, fun I have in watching these films, um, prepping for the episodes that we do is like um, I watched I, I watched this again for the first time in years um, on on Friday night, and um, what was real fun is like just noticing little things. That you might not otherwise like. I noticed there's this scene where we see a Burger King. We see an advertisement for like Zales Jewelers on a bus bench in the movie. There's um, you see a, a a storefront for like a Toys R Us. And my point, okay, like Zales Jewelers still around. Burger King's obviously still around. I, I don't know. Um, maybe can you imagine a day when there's no longer Burger King? But I, uh, Toys R Us comes to mind, and like um, Toys R Us was real big in 1985, but they're no longer even even around. You know, I, you know it, that is, uh, you know, one of those parts of uh, my generation's childhood. Yeah. Not only being a child, but also being an adult <laughs> and having your own children and going Christmas shopping for your kids. Yeah. You know, I have to admit, for you know, when when I was a, a you know an adult and I I would go Christmas shopping for my kids, that. Just just became such a hugely enjoyable part of my Christmas. Yes, yeah. and 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 you know, and it's it's you know, when I was a kid, I would never be able to get my mind wrapped around that because as a kid, it's all about receiving the gifts. Yeah, 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 yeah. With the toys yeah, yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. But as an adult, I really got a huge, huge, huge amount of joy from going out and buying those presents for my kids. And, you know, and, and part of it was, you know, for my for my son was kind of reliving my childhood and just looking at these toys and going, oh my gosh, these toys are so much better than the toys when I was uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, just sure. like, oh my gosh, if these kids, these toys are around when I was a kid, I would just be so happy. I would just want to jump out of myself. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, and, you know, but that was, you know, that was what it was like back then. Yeah. You know? Again, that's what makes watching these old movies so fun because you look at some of the landscape in the film and some of the stuff is still around some of it you know even something as simple as sears and roebuck there's no more sears we talked about on, that on a previous episode but um getting into again a little more about back to the future um while michael j fox now this is the most interesting thing i found was the top choice to play the role of marty mcfly originally he was not available and they began to shoot the film with a actor eric St uh, stoltz who is he um, you may remember that there was a movie um, with Cher and, and Eric Stoltz. He played her son where he was like deformed. He had some kind of disease where it made his face look kind of funny and people made fun of him. That's who this guy was. And they originally started to shoot the film with him. But then after they um, had done a few scenes with him, they, it quickly became apparent that he's not right for the role. So let's reach out to Michael J. Fox again. And as they say, the rest is history. Well, Back in, you know, back in the 80s, uh, it, 
you know, the early 80s is when I got uh, the nickname, you know, Gar, you know. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, um, then when that movie came out, uh, you know, uh, with uh, with Eric Stoltz and Cher, uh, there was a character in the movie that was actually named Gar. Wow. Uh, what, what was his name? Very famous actor. He was Marlboro Man for a while. And, I'm going to have to look uh, this up. <laughs> Sam Elliott. Uh, it's, it's not Sam Elliott. God, I mean, hugely successful actor. Back in the 70s, he was considered one of the, the most popular good-looking yeah. representation of the ultimate male. Wow. You know, and, and uh, he's uh, the voice in oh god the big Lebowski you know uh, you know the cowboy wow wow what's his, I got what's I, his name the cowboy and the big Lebowski ah I, I, you got me well I'm definitely gonna have to do my but, homework but anyways yeah. uh, that actor uh, played a character the the, um, the the biker character the boyfriend of Cher and his name was Gar and when that came out then that's that's when you know you know people were already calling me Gar because what? it was a nickname yeah. thing that got, I got tagged with wow <laughs> uh, but then when that movie came out then that just made it just more you know uh, where people started you know just really fell into calling me Gar wow wow <laughs> <laughs> you know that that it just it just became a thing at that time, and it was because of that movie. Yeah, yeah, and, and it said that parts of the film had already been shot um, with Eric Stoltz. Um, most of the Back to the Future was filmed in and around California and on the sets of Universal Studios. Why not? Of course, it was a Universal film, so that 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 saved the studio quite a bit of money using their own uh, sets and lot. <laughs> Well, you know, also at that time, uh, you know, my, my parents had moved from West Covina to Hacienda Heights, and we lived in uh, homes, like, right there by the Pointy Hills Mall. Uh, in fact, when my, fer my parents first moved into their house there, the Pointy Hills Mall had not even been built yet. Think about that. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. It was all a big field wow, <laughs> when wow. my parents moved into their house. Yeah. And then they wound up building that mall. And so, you know, you know, when I was a kid I was, or when I was a young adult, uh, I was around, you know, going to that mall when it was brand new. And it was a really big, you know, talk of the town at that time. I imagine they so. filmed those scenes in Back to the Future in the parking lot of Pony Hills Mall. Mall. Yeah. It was a, 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 a you know a landmark. Time, it was a big source of pride for the people it, you know that lived there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, could, could you imagine, Gar, if they had social media back then? You you would have had kids going like and hanging out in the parking lot of that mall, like, oh hey, I'm standing right where Doc Brown and Marty were, you know, in Back to the Future. I could just see it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, it was. Uh, you know, it it, it was. Uh, you know. I, it, I don't think that people really, you know, remember any of that. People were really proud of that. It was a, you know, I don't know. It was it well, kind of, it, you know, pounded your chest over it. Well, you know, Gar, I guess it's kind of like, you know, the, being attached to your sports team. Yeah, you know. Kind of that kind of, uh, you know, an affiliation. Oh, sure. Pride. You know, Gar, um, I have a similar story in that, um, not that I live near there, but um, I remember that mall for the simple fact that my aunt, who's now, um, passed on she used to live in Roland Heights which was very close to where that mall is and so every time we'd go see her we'd like drive by the mall so I remember it for that reason alone you know you know back in the day it was it, I, it was a very beautiful mall oh, sure you sure know I mean it, yeah I just remember it. it just just had that element of wow a real big wow factor for that place yeah now let's, but, you know uh, but then again yeah? you know uh, you know what 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 also became a huge star of the movie that almost was never, well, you know, better said, was never really considered as, you know, part of the first, you know, early drafts of the movie because they were really, you know, considering the time machine being a refrigerator. Wow, wow. 
In it fact, was not in their plans at the beginning of the movie to have it be a DeLorean. But the reason why they did they decided to get away from the refrigerator is if the movie was really, really popular, there was a very high potential, and this is true. Mm -hmm. It was a very high potential for children to, you know, you know, accidentally get locked in a refrigerator because that did happen uh, in the early years of refrigerators that children would yeah. get trapped, you know, get inside and close the door and get locked in there because the doors would lock back in those days and the children would die. Yeah. And that was a hazard. It was a known hazard at that time. And you would see commercials on TV, remember? For parents, sure, sure. You know, you know, you know, make sure your children, you know, it, there was a, a bunch of things just educating the public sure. about the dangers of children getting in a refrigerator. So that's the reason why they decided to get away from a refrigerator. They didn't want to. They didn't want to encourage, you know, uh, young people that weren't old enough to know the dangers of sure. that. And and then magically, you know, they 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 spent a long time trying to figure this out. But you have to admit, picking the DeLorean was perfection. Yeah. Hey, it I, was yeah. literal perfection. Yeah, and, and you know, um, Gar, I even was reading, so um, it became such a huge part of the film, you know, that's the other thing they decided, that they didn't want to have a typical kind of, um, you know, what you'd see for a time machine in a movie, so they like, we, we want to have something really special that kind of really stands out, and when people see it, they're going to remember Back to the Future, and um, again, I think of all the time travel movies, um, that's the very reason I remember this film for, for the DeLorean. What a cool looking time machine, first of all. And I was also reading, which it, I, I would think um, if you were Robert Zemex would be really cool. He got a fan letter from, of all people, John DeLorean thanking him for using the DeLorean in the film. Yeah, yeah, and that, you know, the, the story, you know, of what, you know, what happened to him and everything, and, the you same, know, how yeah. that all, Went you down. know, turned out and everything, it, it's a sad story, sure, sure. you know what I mean, because the DeLorean was a passion project for John DeLorean, you know, and such a passion project that it wound up getting him, you know, thrown in jail for yeah. breaking the law, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, I was around when that whole embarrassing you know thing happened and he wound up getting busted you know and, and all he was really trying to do this is all he was trying was he was trying to save his company because he it was that big of a passion for him yeah. you know he really was putting everything he could put into it and and when it started faltering and he needed more capital uh, you know and, and then it, it just turned out that way it's, it's a sad story, sad story you know, sure. I, I feel really bad for him because you know I mean he you know he, he was not a criminal all he was doing was trying to save his company yeah yeah very sad story and you know let, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the cast now obviously um, we mentioned Michael J. Fox played the part of Marty McFly high school student and aspiring musician again um, I think that's part of what made this um Character stand out was, um, you know, from the from the get go, you know, the scene that you you're talking about, the opening of the movie where, you know, he he um, gets, you know, the, the, the feedback and all that from the guitar amplifier. I mean, really really cool. And then I was reading in the scene where he's playing the guitar, you know, Johnny B. Good scene. Um, actually, a couple interesting things about that. Um, one of the black guys in the um, in, in the band was Marvin Berry, who I guess was real-life um, cousin of Chuck Berry, if you can believe that. Yeah, I, to, to this day, I still hold Chuck Berry in such awe oh, sure. and high regard. You know, he, you know, just like little Richard, you know, he is, you know, he is a man to highly, highly respect because the music and the rock and roll and everything that we enjoyed mm. would not be here if it wasn't for people like him. Yeah, I and mean, then Johnny, Johnny be good. Uh, see, see, that's such interesting thing that when you're seeing the film initially, you, you might not even be aware of. Johnny B. Good, of course, was a Chuck Berry original, so 
fact that they maybe couldn't get Chuck Berry, but let's let's have let's get Chuck's cousin. He's also a musician. He can play in the band with Michael J. Fox. I mean, what what a cool kind of reference point that was. Um, and then I was reading. I forgot to write the guy's name down, but that actually um, is not Michael J. Fox singing. Of course, they they had dubbed some other guy like over his voice, pretending you know that he was sing It was coming out of Michael J. Fox. And so initially, the guy that did the voice, he did not get. Um, paid anything for it because they wanted to try to convince people that it was Michael J. Fox, but eventually down the line, he's, uh, the film company agreed to pay him some kind of um, royalty and give him credit for it, so I guess that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, you know, but, but you know, he, he really have to admit that, yeah. he, you know, he, his voice sounded so... My, so much like it would have been yeah. Michael J. Fox. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, you know, you it, 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 the choice of that particular person's voice was just another one of those elements of perfection. They really threaded the needle in picking the right voice, so it was believable. And then what's interesting is I, I, I'm I'm assuming that maybe Michael J. Fox always like a lot of people. Had success as an actor, always had, had aspired to maybe be a musician as well, or maybe that was his first dream. And I say that because I think by learning uh, to play the guitar and stuff, like you were saying for Back to the, the Back to the Future role, it, it did lead to other things. Like, um, for example, he, he eventually did the movie Light of Day with Joan Jett, where you know he's in a band with Joan Jett, um, playing guitar, doing that. So that was actually a movie that did wasn't that successful. No. Actually, that no. was a good movie. Yeah, yeah. I saw that movie and I really liked it and that movie was another movie that was kind of edgy sure. for Michael J. Fox yeah and it was maybe you know, it was... it's very very different from what everybody is used to the kind of characters so that movie uh, that's just another one of those movies that I highly suggest for sure. people to go back and if you get a chance to see it that's a lost diamond sure and just because it's a very good movie just because something's not successful at the box office doesn't mean it's not good. It just people, you know, maybe miss it the first time around, or maybe because it didn't get a lot, a lot of great reviews, people didn't go see it. But but who knows? And and the other thing is, again, while he didn't go on to have a huge um, recording career of any kind, um, I, I read on I read in a book recently that they put out on Michael J. Fox and the different things he's done. Um, it was talking about like he recently at some charity event got up like with Steven Tyler and, and um, play guitar, you know, with a bunch of other musicians on stage. And so, again, it's not something that he's known for, but the fact that he can get invited to those type of jams and take part, I think, is pretty cool. Very cool. Very cool. You know, you know, you know just another one of those things that I stumbled on this yeah. was, was the actual high school that's in the movie. Yeah. Uh, Hill Valley High School was actually filmed at Whittier High School right here in Southern California. How cool is that? That was the high school that they used for the movie. And, uh, of course, Whittier High School still stands today. Sure. So, you know, that's just another, you know, slice of, you know, history for the movie, you know, that, you know, that, that, that high school, you know, you know, that is was the high school that they chose. Sure, and you know, another kind of standout character throughout the film, I mean, he doesn't have a major role, but he's got a, he leaves a big enough impression, not just on me and you, but on, I think, anybody that's seen the film, I mean, I'll just give you the line, and I think you know who I'm talking about, um, Amy McFly, your shoe's untied! <laughs> of course, I'm talking about the character of Biff, played by actor... Thomas F. Wilson, and, and it's kind of interesting. He, he's like your classic bully. You know, he's picking on um, uh, George McFly, Marty's dad, all through the film. And um, and he's one of those guys you just kind of love to hate, hate, hate Biff. You hope that, I mean, one of the funniest scenes in the whole movie is when um, Marty gets on the skateboard uh, hovercraft, and he, he's, um, you know, he's running around there chasing him in, in Biff's car, and then all the manure goes into Biff's car. And, and I'm like, that was one of the funniest scenes of the entire film. It sure was. And and he did such a good job at portraying the bully. Yeah. And and when uh you know, when uh you know, looking into you know, just doing the research and everything, you know, he in, in real life he he was he's actually the 
opposite of the Biff character. Yeah, yeah. And and so so uh, it's you know what what he said is you know uh, the influences that he uh, used for the character was based on all of the bullies that he had actually encountered in his in his life. Yeah, and you know um, you know uh, when we done our family. Uh, Ty's episode, Gar, last time, and we were talking about doing today's episode, you had mentioned that one of your favorite actors in this movie, and I can kind of see now, but I watched the movie again last Friday, um, Crispin Glover, who of course plays a part of uh, Marty's dad, George McFly, and I mean, again, um, I mean, he's such a nerd that you just can't help but kind of um, hope that things are going to turn around for him, and you know, kind of a pivotal scene in the whole movie is where, you know, Again, he has no idea that Marty's his future son. He thinks he's just some kid he encountered in high school, and they're fr- they're becoming friends. And he kind of says, "Okay, George, you know, you, you gotta you gotta ask you, you gotta ask Lorraine out to the uh, a, a dance, you know, and, and come up with a plan to do it." And things kind of go sour. He thinks he's going up to Marty, but it's actually Bip, Bip that's kind of going crazy and trying to attack Lorraine. And he's like, "Listen here, damn you!" And then and Biff turns around and he's like, "Uh oh, uh oh." I, uh, what am I going to do? But then there's the ultimate scene where George uh, punches, you know, Biff in the face, and 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 everything kind of ends as it should. Well, let's let's talk about Crispin Glover. Yeah, who played that role? Okay, yeah. the person that plays the dad, um, Crispin Glover. I am a huge fan of Crispin Glover. And uh, he's one of those actors that's uh, like ex- not very diverse, extremely diverse. Sure. And, uh, you know, whenever you see him in a, a movie or, or portraying another character, it is always completely different and you, there's no association to any other character whatsoever. It, they, all characters stand on their own. And, and he has done some of the absolutely most bizarre performances in movies as bit characters uh, that I have ever ever seen he is an extremely talented actor but you know when i was uh you know doing the research i found that you know when they uh when they did uh, back to the future part two he wasn't invited back uh, and the reason why he wasn't invited back is because he's a weird dude yeah yeah he's a really weird dude and, and uh, <laughs> So, uh, you know, I just I just had to bring that up because a lot of, you know, he's kind of one of those actors that, you know, people don't really even know much about nowadays. Uh, but, you know, it, it, to be honest with you, I, you know, I, I don't be surprised if he comes out with a character somewhere in some movie or some TV yeah. show or something like that that just jumps out at the public and the public winds up, you know, reacting to it. Now, either in a positive way or a negative way. I don't know. That I that I couldn't say. But he is definitely capable. He's one of those actors that can just jump out nowadays and do a, a groundbreaking character. He's that kind of an actor. Which kind of explains why he's never been even um, nominated for an Oscar or any kind, type of award. No, he, he is so bizarre, yeah. you know, that there that, that has a lot to do whether, you know, he get, even gets invite, invited to do characters. But, uh, you know, um, <laughs> I, uh, you yeah. can go on YouTube. You can go on yeah. YouTube. And there's a character that Crispin Glover uh, portrays, and it's a bit part in a movie called wild at heart and you can go to youtube and just see Chris, you know crispin glover's character dell okay you know you know okay. guys because i gotta tell you when you mentioned in the last episode about this guy crispin glover just the name i, I couldn't really put, um like who, who the hell's crispin glover but then you know i was reading and doing research for today's episode okay he's the one to play george mcfly and and it's sad that you could have a, an actor that talented and 
and maybe sadly that we'll be talking about what a great actor he is very much kind of like um, you're saying John Hughes director John Hughes um, who's a huge writer and director he really didn't get any accolades until after he passed away really I mean um, and maybe be the same thing with this guy but um, to kind of to wrap today's episode up um, we should also mention singer Huey Lewis who performed the hit song Power of Love has a um, cameo role in the Back to the Future film. Um, he plays a part of a judge um, during the Battle of the Band scene. And, you know, and, and there's a lot of people that don't know that that was actually Huey Lewis doing that scene. Yeah, and, and, and interestingly enough, while everybody knows about the hit song, um, back, um, you know, um, what was it, Power of Love, he also has another song in there, um, I guess wasn't as big of a hit, but people kind of forget about it, called Back in Time. Um, uh, that's a good song too. Yeah, yeah, and it says um, Robert Zemeckis decided to make Huey Lewis and the News Marty's favorite band, um, and Huey Lewis was very honored, but did not feel that he could write a song for a movie that would be successful. But he wrote the song "Power of Level," which went on to become a huge hit. I mean, it's 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 the one song when you think of Back to the Future. That's the I mean, there's other songs on the soundtrack, but that's the one that immediately comes to mind. And, and, and you know, it, it, at that time, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it was it, it was like a whole explosion for all of that. Yeah. From Back to the Future, for Back in Time, for Huey Lewis's mm -hmm. career. It's it's just like all of that. Exploded. And you know what's funny? Back in, in back in 1985. Back in 1985, Huey Lewis was a very big thing. And and sadly, I don't know if too many people are aware of this, but you don't really hear too much about Huey Lewis anymore these days. I mean, like a lot of um, people his age, he's retired. But mostly the reason he's retired is because of all the years of playing music, he's gone seriously deaf. And so he's, he's unable to get out there and play. Well, if you're the singer yeah. and you're deaf, that means you can't sing on key. Yeah, yeah. That means you're singing a whole bunch of notes that you're off on that note, and the only people that can tell are the people listening to you. Yeah. And that's just a really, you know, for any uh, musician, say like even a singer like myself, yeah. you know, that is, uh, that's a very frightening, you know, uh, scenario that, that, you know, I, I would never want to face yeah. uh, because because as a musician uh, you 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 want to be able to walk away on your own terms. Sure. And when you have to walk away and it's not on your own terms, you're actually forced to because of extenuating circumstances. It just leaves a, 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 a bad feeling in your gut. You yeah. know what I mean? It, it's not a good feeling. Yeah, and, and you know, before we wrap up today's show, Gar, we should touch on a couple of things. The first being that, um, you know, kind of the elephant in the room, which is... Um, for, for several years now, Michael J. Fox um, has been suffering from Parkinson's disease, and I, it re was recently came out that um, he's in the early stages of dementia. I think he's about 64, 65 age, but, um, but even at that age, it's kind of um, young to get dementia, but um, more and more people are getting that. And, and um, you know, the last thing he was really able to do was, like, um, he used to voice Stuart Little, so, and it's been years since he did any kind of... Um, film work but we got all this great um these great films to remember and buy and family ties so that's part of the reason i wanted to do this so it, it's sad that he's he's another star on the horizon maybe in a few years we'll no longer be here but as far as parkinson's disease he's raised a lot of money for it i think he's helped raise a lot of awareness so you know um he's formed the michael j fox foundation that raises money for it so you know good for him for doing that well yeah and 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 uh you know the you know the 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 you know, it's it's unfortunate. You know, being you know talking about you know this be this yeah. you know because you know he's such a you know we we always in our minds we always view him as that young yeah. you know doing movies with like fast pace you know because everything happens in Back to the Future at a fast oh, pace. oh sure sure you know and and you know we always view that's our uh, memory. The memory picture of him, yeah. and uh, yeah, and then you know to, to you know you know to have the reality of of you know where he's at now. It, it, I I think um, 
I think the public uh, is is having more difficulty uh, accepting that and and getting their minds wrapped around it. Than he is. I, I think than he is. I, you know, you know, because he's so close to it. You know, he's the one that's experiencing it, everything. But I, I, I honestly, you know, I just feel it strongly in in my gut that, that the American public is is not not happy at all as to what is happening and how his life is is uh, full, unfolding in front of us now. And, you know, we all want him, you know, to to uh, to still be the Michael J. Fox that we we love, yeah. even in his later projects that were still yeah. very popular. I mean, I, I mean, we're talking about it now, Gar, and you know, I think when he does pass away, it's going to be such a huge loss. I mean, um, just the thought of it. I mean, more and more people we're losing, and I think the older we get, you know, more of our heroes and people from our um, younger uh, days, you know, are, are passing away and stuff. You know, again, this is this is pop culture, and, and it, these people mean so much to us. I mean, I, there have been other stories, like, you don't see Jack Nicholson anymore, because he, he's been suffering for, for a number of years now with Alzheimer's, too, but he started um, how they kind of found out about Jack Nicholson. He, he was going to get movie roles, and he couldn't remember his lines, and he finally got diagnosed so more and, and even david casty you know before he finally died um um people thought he was um you know alcoholic or somebody come to find out he was suffering from dementia and he he quit performing too because he couldn't even remember the words to his own songs but I, I just thought we should kind of cover that before we wrap up today's show and uh, i uh, final um couple things i want to mention as we always do and what was going on in the world in 1985 which i thought Kind of some fun stuff to look back on. Um, Ronald Reagan was in the second term of his presidency. Supergroup, I think you remember this, USA for Africa, United Support of Africa, of Artists for Africa, re recorded the hit song, um, We Are the World, We Are the Children, of course, written by Michael Jackson and um, Lionel Richie. Um, do you remember that? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, I definitely remember it. And, th and that was a big deal back in there. Yeah. You know, back at that time. You know, it really, really was a big deal. And, I, I you know, just another one of those things that, you know, has, you know, been kind of lost in context over the years. In fact, I often wonder, you know, they had such a hit with that song. Why wasn't there a full album? Why why haven't they recorded other songs to raise money? Who, who knows? I mean, everybody's busy. I get that. And many of the people took part in that have since um, passed on. But but just to kind of talk about, you know, what was going on, what was huge in 1985, um, I was really interested to, to read this. The Food and Drug Administration, FDA, approved a blood test for AIDS infection since then for screening of all blood donations. I mean... AIDS was a big thing back in the mid '80s, and and for a long time, people didn't even know how you got it, and people were donating bl um, infected blood, and so that that's a huge thing, you know. Yes, and I remember that too. I remember all of that. Yeah, and then um, now I um, said um, March seventeenth, nineteen eighty-five, serial killer Richard Ramirez, known as the Night Stalker, um, committed the first two murders in his Los Angeles uh, murder spree. And, and, of course, if you heard about that on the news, I remember um, one of the main points of the report was the fact that he listened to heavy metal music, he was an ACDC fan, and the music must have made him into a killer. <laughs> That's one of the first things. I and that was, that was what, uh, you know, they were, uh, there was an element of our society that was really pounding on the table hard at that time, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know that 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 music was devil music, and that music was the 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 blame. And you, had and, you know, and, and uh, you know, and you know, there was there were other uh, attacks on music, you know, with this with the same thing. The uh, uh, the the ch the kid that committed suicide, the Judas Priest, uh, yeah. and because he, he liked Ozzy's music, and he used to. Uh, uh, he used to listen to Ozzy's song "Suicide Solution" yeah. a lot, yeah, yeah. and uh, and then Ozzy had to get come. He was actually forced to come out to make a public statement that "Suicide Solution," the the reference in wasn't that suicide was a solution. It was that that the solution was the alcohol. Alcohol. Yeah. 
It was a liquid, yeah. and which is another definition sure. of solution. And so that that was you know, he literally was forced to make a public to actually explain what he was talking about in the song. I remember that. And to to the you know to the rest of the you know American public that was fine. They understood that. But to the people you know that just had their you know made their mind up and they just will not budge and just you know that their their mind was made up. You know whether it was true or not. Yeah. It didn't make any difference that you know that he explained. It or not. And you remember, there was no change in their attitude towards his music. His music was to blame, and that was the final word. And you remember Tipper Gore and all those other senators' wives and the PMRC wanting to sticker all of those records. Um, all that did yeah. was make those records even more popular because now kids are going into the record store looking for those labels because those were the records that they wanted. Yeah, and, and I thought um, this was a real fun fact, and I, re I do remember this, Gar. Um, the Coca-Cola Company changed its formula on April 2nd, 1985, and unleashed the new Coke. And the new Coke received such a backlash that three months later, the new Coke was no more, and the original Coke was back on the shelves. That backlash was real. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, during that time... You know, the, that was exactly how the public reacted to it. It was just, we love our Coke the way we love it. Don't change it. Yeah, and here, that was yeah. basically what the public said. I mean, literally, you could not deny it. They they put their foot down. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I mean, um, I, there's never been anything like that or since. I mean, you never had Pepsi or Sprite thinking of changing their formula. Okay, we're not going to... Go where Coke went. I mean, every, you've never seen anything like... And then just kind of to wrap up 1985, that was also the year that um, this was a big deal. Michael Jackson buys the Beatles catalog of music. Um, I remember that, you know. There were, there were a lot of people that were appalled about that. Paul McCartney being there was, one. There was a big backlash about that. Paul McCartney being one, I remember it, it affected his friendship with Michael Jackson to the point that they were no longer... Friends, I mean, that's the thing to think about. Michael Jackson's no longer here, so probably some of his relatives own that music. And, and it's, can you imagine? It'd be Paul McCartney? You know, you know, that's, that's, you know, just another one of those vices of history, you know. But, you know, that, that yeah, as time goes along, it gets faded and faded. But, you know, but, yeah, that, that was a big deal back then. Smart it business really move. Was. Smart business move on Michael Jackson. But can you imagine being Paul McCartney not owning any of the rights to your songs? Wow. And and uh, just to kind of wrap this up, finally, the, the, some popular new shows at the time that were just premiering, Larry King Live. I mean, just think about that. Um, growing, Mary. Yeah, Growing Pains, The Golden Girls, Bill Cosby. So, again, that's what was going on in 1985, Gar. I had real fun, as always. I love these Sundays. So, Gar, um, let's let's say goodbye for now. If you could hold on for a minute, I'm going to talk to you a little bit. Off hold, hold on, one, one more thing. Sure, one sure, more thing. sure. Uh, back in 1985, a, a carton of 12 eggs was 80 cents. Inflation and and, and I got, how much are eggs going for now? Seven dollars at least, um, maybe eight dollars. You're, you're, if you're lucky, uh, I mean, let's let's in not even. 1985, that carton of 12 eggs. Was eighty cents. Don't even get me started on what gas used to be. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Uh, okay, that's for another episode. You know, God, I cannot stress enough how much I enjoy doing this show with you, Jason. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll talk to you later, Guard. Just hold on for a minute. I'm going to talk to you a little off air, okay? All good. Chaotic Rift Magazine.